Well, good day, guys, and welcome to another week of MBM Online. I'm Jethro. And I'm Kartika. And we're really excited to have you with us today, especially if you're new um, or just tuning in for the first time. We'd love you to go to the link on screen now to get in touch with us. So, Kartika, you've just had a bit of uh, time away. Uh, what have you been up to? Yeah, so over the weekend, I celebrated two weddings of, of two very special people. Uh, one was my brother on Saturday, uh, and on Sunday was my very good friend. And got a chance to actually do the bridal bouquet for my sister-in-law. So that was wow. stressful, but also very fun. Awesome. Yeah. So you've done a bit of floristry stuff before? No, no, that was the first time. So it was a bit like, oh, what do I do? But <laughs> you can't go wrong with beautiful flowers. You just got to kind of arrange them in such a way. And yeah, bam. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's more floristry than I've done, certainly. So good on you, Karika. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, why don't you tell us about a couple of the things that are happening in the life of our church? Yeah, definitely. So we've got Explaining Christianity, um, and that's something for you or anyone that you know who'd love to know what is Christianity all about? Who is Jesus? And all those questions can be answered um, at Explaining Christianity. Um, and that's happening over the course of four Mondays and starting on the 3rd of May. So I really do encourage you to join and come along and get your questions answered. And it's a very very safe environment. Don't feel any pressure uh, to come with anything. Just come as you are. We'd love to have you there. And also we have belonging, uh, which is an opportunity for you to get to know uh, who is MBM, what is MBM, and who are the pastors um, who are at MBM. Um, so that's a chance for you to get to know the vision of our church and an opportunity to get to know other people who are also wanting to know what life at MBM is like. Um, so that's happening on the 15th of May, and that's a whole, I guess, morning to lunch. Um, sorry, morning to afternoon, including lunch. And so we'd love to love for you to come along and join us. Absolutely. And you can sign up for both uh, Explaining Christianity and the Belonging event on the MBM website. Well, today we're going to be hearing from one of our pastors here, Ray. He's going to be speaking to us from the book of Colossians. Um, and we're going to be looking at... Um, who Jesus is uh, and what that means for us. Um, and so uh, before we get to that, uh, why don't you close your eyes with me as I pray? Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can uh, learn from it, that you teach us from it. I pray that you would be working powerfully through Ray today as he speaks to us, uh, that you'd be showing us the truth about your son, Jesus. Um, Father, we Thank you today on Anzac Day as we celebrate those who have uh, served and given their lives. Father, we uh, really thank you for their sacrifice um, and we thank you for the amazing peace um, and prosperity that we enjoy in Australia at the moment. Um, Father, we pray that you would continue that, you continue to bless us in that way. And Father, I pray for all people who are uh, tuning in today um, who might have sickness or sick relatives. Um, Father, I pray that you would bring healing to those situations. Um, Father, I pray that you would uh, have your hand over the coming Explaining Christianity course, that uh, lots of people would be coming along hearing your gospel preached and coming to know you. Please help us as we think about who we can invite to that course. Um, and Father, as we come to your word now, please prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now let's use our voices to sing praises to our Father in heaven. Let's sing. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. One strong now shaken We trust forever in your name The name of Jesus Oh, we trust the name of Jesus You are the only King forever Almighty God, we lift you higher 
are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. in all your wisdom in love and justice you will reign every knee will bow we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of Jesus oh we trust Jesus, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus. Your kingdom has no end We lift our banner high We lift the name of Jesus From age to age you reign Your kingdom has no end You are the only king forever Almighty God, we lift you higher You are the only king forever Forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Hey friends and welcome to MBM Online and Ray Galea here. It's been a while, I've been on holidays, had a great time and thoroughly enjoyed last Sunday while in the car my wife put on uh, MBM Online and we were listening to pre-preach and uh, it was so encouraging. We were singing the songs, uh, we were travelling from one part of Sydney to another and it was so encouraging. So Thank you for all those. Thank you, Andy, behind the camera for your work. Uh, it was terrifically encouraging. Now, normally we would have the speaker for Sunday preach, and that would be Grant Dibden, who's our guest preacher for this Sunday today, because it's Anzac Day. And uh, we thought we, we would get Grant Dibden, who not only is um, a, uh, a head of Navigators, he actually, a former member of NBM, of course, uh, and, and we have so many precious memories of him, but he's actually now a bishop in the armed forces uh, within the army, uh, once a colonel. Uh, and uh, 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 now a, a bishop in the armed forces proclaiming Christ. And so uh, he'll be preaching this Sunday. So if you get a chance, let me encourage you to get to church on Sunday because that's going to be a great service. But I just want to say today, as, as today's fallen on Anzac Day, that it's always worth remembering the, the sacrifice that has been given for our freedom. Now, this is not to say that every war Australia's been in has been a right one. I think it's pretty clear that a number of our engagements military have not been the ones that I would want to support. World War II was an obvious one where we should have been involved, but the Vietnam War, you know, it's a blight on the history of Australia. But we must always distinguish the rights and wrongs of wars and the decisions governments have made concerning that and the men and women who have actually given up their life and the families who have given up their life uh, and, their, and their loved ones for the sake of military engagement. So 
It's very important to separate the two. And I want to honour and thank God for all of our fellow Australians who have given up so much in this context. So uh, I, I commend, and what, I, what I'd like to do now is just um, uh, turn to prayer and, and to thank God and bring uh, those, uh, particularly those vets now who are really experiencing the trauma of military engagement before the Lord because they have sacrificed so much and the trauma continues throughout their life. Let's pray. Father, we do want to say thank you for the fact that in spite of the fact that not every military campaign was probably the right one, we do want to say thank you for every soldier, uh, male, female, uh, every family who gave up a son, a, a husband, a wife, uh, a, a spouse, uh, a brother, a sister, Father, for the sake of pursuing freedom, justice on our shores and beyond. Uh, and we want to say, Lord, um, please be with the vets, Lord, this day, those who have been engaged in and are now present, the, engaged in military conflict and paying the price still to today, the trauma that they've experienced. We, we do pray that you would comfort them and minister to them. We pray that the church would bless them, that they would know that as a nation we are for them and that uh, the government, especially with the recent Royal Commission uh, 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 concerning vets, uh, that that will actually bring up whatever needs to be brought up in terms of our failure to care for those men and women who have been traumatised by military engagement. But Lord, thank you again for the sacrifice that uh, many men and women have made uh, through the course of our history. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, friends, we're looking at Colossians 1, verses 15 to 23. Let me read it out to you. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making a peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. It's a great passage. It's one of my favourite passages. And uh, as we look at it, uh, I am reminded of the fact that um, uh, uh, one of the members of our church many years ago said this great line. She said, you know, all of life is connected to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I heard that, I thought, wow, that's such a profound way of saying what this passage is actually saying. Um, that at the heart of the Bible is the gospel, and at the heart of the gospel is our Lord Jesus Christ in all his supremacy. Because at the end of the day, friends, guess what? It's not about you. And it's certainly not about me. You matter to God, absolutely, but it's not about you. It's, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was once a very famous... Um, I guess, humorous way of uh, trying to answer the question, uh, what is the meaning of life? And, uh, and I think they came up with the answer 42. Well, they should have known the answer was actually one, just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, kind of right question, wrong answer. But we've got the right question and the right answer in this passage. So let's look at it. Now, the context is it, it's a prayer. It, it comes in the midst of a prayer of thanksgiving by the Apostle Paul and uh, where we are presented with the Son in whose kingdom we now dwell. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son in whom he loves. And this is now is what is said of the Son in all his glory. So get ready. Here we go. Firstly, he is the image of the invisible God. Verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, Christ makes the God you cannot see known. Um, he, is the per he is the exact representation of God's being. That's how Hebrews 1 puts it. Um, you don't have to guess what God is like. Um, to the question, you know, 
uh, how do I know if God exists? Easily, just turn to Jesus, because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. He's not just a pale reflection of what God is like. Jesus is God. You can say it that starkly. In the words of Thomas, my Lord and my God. Um, uh, later we'll read all the fullness of, of, the, of God dwells in bodily form. Uh, and that's why Jesus says to Philip, when Philip says, show us the Father, and Jesus is a little bit shirty with him. He says, you know, if you've seen me, Phil, you've seen the Father. In other words, what do you think you've been looking at for the last three years? Um, and that's why Christians have assurance. We know God. Why? Because we know Jesus Christ and are in relationship with him. Now, secondly, so, well, first to kind of say, so as Christ stands in relation to God, he is the perfect image. And as Christ is in relation to, crea- to, to the world, he is its creator, the agent of all creation. Look at verse uh, 15 again. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn is the language of supremacy, uh, that he's not part of creation. We'll see that a little bit later. He is supreme over creation. Um, firstborn in Middle Eastern world gets the inheritance um, he holds rank over all of it. Uh, if there was any doubt that Christ could be part of creation, then verse 16 makes it perfectly clear that he's not a part of creation. He is the agent of all creation. Look at verse 16. This is why we worship him, friends. For in him, that is in Christ, how many things? All things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Look at the sheer vastness, the comprehensiveness of the supremacy of God, of Christ. And and there is nothing that Christ has not created. Firstly, look at the series of clauses that pile up on itself. How many things were created? All things. By that he means things in heaven and on earth. By that he includes things visible and invisible. By that he covers thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. Well, pretty much after that, there's nothing left, right? Uh, If Jesus didn't make it, it don't exist. If Jesus didn't make it, it don't exist. Every corner of the universe, physical and spiritual, is covered. And that includes angels, yes, even demons, including Satan himself. That's right. Sometimes you need to say it that starkly. Jesus created the devil. Sure, he didn't create him as the devil. He created him as an angel who turned bad, like Adam who rebelled. Um, But he did. Do not think, there is a spiritual battle going on, but do not think that the battle is is like two cage fighters going three rounds and you're just not sure who's going to win. Oh, no. From the very beginning, it was clear how the story would end. Uh, And that's why Jesus says, Hell was first created for the devil and the angels. That is to say, and his angels rather. Uh, And that is is to say simply this, that from the very beginning, the destiny of Satan was already worked out. Jesus created hell for the devil and his angels. Now, the Colossians, as you read the letter, were tempted to pray to uh, and worship and be led in worship by angels. And, you know, that's exactly what happens. When Christ is not supreme, our worshipful hearts will find themselves worshipping something else. I mean, I grew up as a, as a Maltese a Roman Catholic, and, you know, I grew up, and Jesus was referred to as Il Bambin, the baby. Well, you know, if that's your view of Jesus and he stays a baby, you're not likely to worship him. So I want to say, um, if, you're, if you're into Christian religion and you don't have a supreme view of Jesus, you'll end up worshipping something like Mary and the Saints. If you're into non-Christian religion, it'll be probably worshipping some gods gods or gurus. Uh, if you're into the New Age, it'll be um, crystals or angels. If you're into the dark arts, it'll be demons. If you're an animist, it'll be the spirits. If you're an atheist, it'll be the mind and reason and logic. But once you see Jesus in all his glory, the perfect revealer of the Father and the creator and sustainer of the universe then he's the one you bow before. He's not just number one, he's the only one. And Jesus therefore answers all the big questions of life, does he not? You know, questions that people have been asking from the very beginning of time, questions that children are prepared to ask and we adults are afraid to ask, too busy to ask, and sometimes afraid to ask. Questions like, who made me? 
Why do I exist? What's the purpose of life? And I don't know if you realize it, but in that verse I just read out from verse 16, the answer is given in the most simplest and profound words. There's five words there that you could almost trip over them. It's, it's, the, it's the answer to the question of why I exist. For all things were created through him and for him. We were created through him and for him, for Jesus, to be in relationship with him. You exist to be in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the answer to the question, why you exist, and all for God's glory. God made the universe for his Son. And that's the message we take to the world, that Jesus is the Son of God who is the ruler and creator of the universe and who died in our place. And I think when you grasp that, you realise um, that it kind of jars the way in which the modern world speaks. Um, and it, it's a counterpoint to the classic love songs and the movie one-liners of the last 50 years. You know, like if you like me and I'm now 60 and, you know, songs like it in the 70s, I think, you know, I can't live if living is without you. Think about that. Really? I can't live if living. Yeah, and that's a word you'd address to Jesus, not to a lover. Or you are the reason I was born. That was a super tram song in the in the eighties. Um, uh, don't worry, I'll get eventually to the last few decades. Um, or you complete me, Jerry Maguire. You know, as she looks at um, uh, at, at, at the at the love of her life and says, "You complete." Oh no, he looks at her and says, "You complete me." Um, uh, or all of me loves all of you. And really, the words capture the spirit of our age and the idols of our heart. Uh, and the songs, you know, without realising it, but they kind of remove Christ from his rightful place as supreme. You see, that language that I've just described in those songs and scripts, movie scripts, that language can only, should only, must only ever be directed towards Jesus and him alone. Well, it's not just Christ created us and then went on his merry way to, to let us uh, go on our merry way. The one who is before all th- the one who created all things is before all things, is the one who holds all things together. Look at verse 17. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. You know, we say of a person who's under a lot of pressure but managing it well, wow, he's really keeping it all together, you know. Uh, it's a phrase we like to use. Well, I'm telling you, Jesus is literally keeping it all together. Um, Hebrews 1.3 says he sustains all things by the power of his word. That would be the same one who hung on the cross. Sustains all things by the power of his word. See, if the job of science is to give natural explanations for the natural world, that's its job, no more and no less. The job of the Bible is to give ultimate explanations for the, um, uh, for, for the spiritual world, the, the, the definitive answers. And Christ is the one not gravitational forces. Christ is the one who sustains the universe and is bringing all things to its appointed end. Look, I believe in gravity. I'm just saying gravity is, for example, the natural explanation. But the one who's sustaining the universe is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. History is moving in one direction and he is determining its final outcome. We're at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he and he alone is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ is supreme in this age and in the age to come. Um, and, and he's supreme in reconciliation. Look at verse 16. Sorry, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So Christ rules in creation and he rules over his people, the church. That Christ is head of the church, which is his body. Notice the intimate tight connection between Christ and his people, likening to a head on a body. Sever them and you'll have death. Jesus says, remember the words of Jesus that kind of capture that union? Whenever, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it unto me. That we're so tightly bound to Jesus that when you mess with God's people, you mess with God. When you ignore Christ's people, you you ignore Christ. When you love Christ's people, you love Christ. Why? Because Christ is the head of the body, which is his church, whom he died for. And the church, therefore, belongs to Jesus. Um, He rules the church. He is the senior pastor of every church, not Ray Galim. And it's right to say, so for example, at MBM, it's right to say that um, this is Christ's church. 
It's even right to say this is our church. But you know what you must never say? It's Ray Galea's church. It offends me, but I tell you this, it really offends him. (laughs) Because it's his church. He purchased it with with his own blood. Look at verse 18 again. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So the church he rules is the church he leads into the age of the resurrection. We are God's forever people. Jesus firstborn from the dead, literally first among the dead ones. Um, He spearheads a new people, the church, a foretaste of the new creation, the first fruits, the deposit of what is to come. And God raised Christ from the dead with this explicit purpose. And I quote to you in verse 18, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Firstborn of creation, firstborn of the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So that he might, literally, so that he might be first. Uh, He ranks supreme in this age, wow, and in the age to come. He rules uh, number one in this creation and in the next. He rules over all people and he rules over God's people. So the one who is firstborn of creation, firstborn of the dead, um, is so that in everything he might be second, no first. That's why John the Baptist was so right. And it's the mantra every Christian ought to to have tattooed on their soul. He must increase, I must decrease. And he is first, obviously, because he is God. Uh, Verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. You know, on that first Christmas day, it not only made us happy uh, that that God became flesh, uh, it actually made God happy. God was pleased to have his son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, become human and permanently remain human. As I like to say, God has permanently sided with us. But why did he do it? With the express purpose of reconciling us to himself. Look at verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. To reconcile. What does that mean? To to bring together that which is apart. To make friends where there was once enemies. To bring peace where there was once war. To put right that which was wrong. God has come in Christ Jesus to reconcile us to himself. Not him to us, but us to himself. He's the point of reference here. The universe that was made by Christ and for Christ is the universe that has been stained by sin in every corner and needs to be put right and restored because there's rebellion in the invisible world with demonic forces and there's rebellion in the human world as we, you know, Christ died for us while we were all enemies. So in some way, If Christ has reconciled all things and Christ created all things, which included Satan, therefore Christ somehow has made peace with the devil. What? Sounds weird, doesn't it? Let's explore what that means. That peace, that God has made peace with all things in Christ Jesus, that peace is not obviously the peace of friendship uh, because I've already said, or Jesus rather, has said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, that the, the peace of friendship isn't kind of holding hands, smoking weed and singing all you need is love. We're not talking about that peace. What we're talking here is pacification. Uh, you know, the Pax Romana was that 200-year period in the Roman Empire where, where there was peace throughout the Roman Empire. The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was marked by the army. And whenever there was any attempt at insurgence or rebellion, the army would just move in and flatten any opposition. You're like anyone who defied the Roman army was was just snuffed out. That's what we're talking about, peace here. This pacification, the peace of Rome involved the army who put down the rebellion. So what we've got to see in the cross isn't simply the place where sins were forgiven, but where Satan was suppressed. Uh, We need to see and ask the question, how in fact did God make peace with the devil at the cross? Well, let me tell you how he did. If you flip over to chapter 2 in Colossians verse 15, you see there that what Christ has done at the cross is that he's paid for our sins and as a role, as a result, has disarmed and humiliated Satan. Satan, who thought he had a victory at Golgotha on that first Good Friday, discovered he was overturned. Uh, Firstly, by having sins paid for, so now he's got no means by which to accuse Christians. He may be shooting bullets at you, but he's shooting blanks. 
He cannot condemn it. He may be the accuser in name, but he can't operate in reality to every Christian because he had a right to accuse us all the way to hell because he knew that's where we were heading, but he can't do it now. Why? Because our debt that we have incurred towards God has been dealt with. And as a result of that, we've been set free. And not only that, death has been defeated because on that third day, Jesus rose again. So Satan has been completely defeated and one day he'll be finally destroyed when Jesus returns. Isn't that good news? Oh, Jesus, he is supreme in every corner. The cross is as much, like I said, about suppressing the enemies of Satan as it is about securing salvation. And at the cross, the great rift between God and in humanity, God and the universe is kind of restored. There's a there's a bringing back into alignment, uh, and we have that in part now, and we'll see the full reality of it when Jesus returns. So here are the facts in summary: Christ is the reason why you exist, that you exist. Christ is the reason why your sins can't condemn you, Satan can't accuse you, and death can't defeat you. Christ is the reason. Uh, that, that you have the right to breathe and the right to access eternal life. At every point, Christ is supreme. There is no corner of your life, there is no square meter on this earth where Jesus cannot plant his flag and say, this is mine, it belongs to me. So let me ask you, friends, is that how you view Jesus in your life? Or have you squeezed him out? Is he in your life? Is he? Does he rule? Does he? Have you got out of the driver's seat and letting him take charge? And if you have let him do that, is there a corner of your life where he is still not number one? But perhaps you think, Ray, you don't know what I've done. I have gone too far. Well, join the rest of us. Uh, look at verse 21. The Apostle Paul says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, But now, that is now that you've come to Christ, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So you can see we were all enemies once. Um, The evidence is seen in what we said and what we thought and what we did. Uh, We've all been funding our own private war against God. (laughs) Some of us have doing it in a defiant, blatant way, shaking our fists and saying God doesn't exist. But most of us have engaged in a Cold War operation, silence and sulking, just displacing him to the side. You know, I'm very bad at Facebook, as possibly you all know, and I sort of get on my Facebook page about three times a year. Sorry about that. Uh, And I discover all these people who've asked to be my friend and I've just ignored them. And I realise, you know, you can reject people in different ways. You can say, no, I don't want you to be my friend. Or you can just ignore the invite and discover you've wounded a whole lot of people unintentionally. Well, you know, we've ignored God, but It's not really unintentional. Whether your war is active and aggressive towards God or whether it's silent and sulking because something bad has happened in your life and you can't let it go and you're blaming him and and that's where it stands and you don't want anything to do with him. Let me tell you, friends, God overcame all of that to bring peace so that we can be right. How did he do that? Peace was brokered over the physical body of the Lord Jesus. Peace of God was brokered over the physical body of the Lord Jesus. True story, I heard of a couple in the United States who uh, were separated on their way to full-blown divorce. And while in a separated state, coincidentally on the same day, firstly the husband came to the grave of their dead son, and then about 10 minutes later, the wife came. And when they saw each other, they were about to walk away because there was still a lot of enmity between them. Remember, they were on their way to getting a divorce. But they thought again and seemed inappropriate given the fact that their body lay, uh, their son's body lay at that gravesite. And so they came and they stood together over their, over their sad, the loss of their dear, their, their dear son. And it was in that moment over their son's grave that their hands reached out to each other for the first time in many years. And from that moment on, their relationship took a journey towards reconciliation and peace. Isn't that beautiful? That peace was brokered over the over the, the grave of their son. Well, the God of the universe has become flesh and brokered peace with us through his physical body. Blood shared on the cross once and for all, never to be repeated. That we who were once enemies could be now friends. And so I ask you, friends, God has made peace with us. Is it not time to take the hand of friendship and accept him as your Lord and Saviour? 
He's made it possible now. There's no reason why we can't be friends except for the fact that we decide not to be. Whether you're engaged in the Cold War, as I suggested, or the blatant host- hostile war, it's time to wave the surrender flag, is it not? And to say, I'm coming, Jesus. You're in charge and I want to be on your side. And you know, and what that means is, what does peace look like? Let me tell you what it looks like because there's some beautiful descriptions here. On the day of judgment, there's going to be no shaming, no condemnation, no blaming, no I told you so. What we're told here is that we will be deemed holy in his sight. We are viewed without blemish and free from accusation. Wow. I mean, them, them's powerful words. The, the effect of faith in the death of Jesus results in the fact that we, will, we are now holy in his sight, even though we still sin every day, without blemish and free from accusations. There's no I told you so on the day of judgment for a Christian. I will remember your sins no more, is what he says. And that's the power of the gospel. That's why all of life is connected to the gospel of our Lord Jesus, because that truth must transform all of our lives. You can't be the same person once you've met the the Lord Jesus in all his spectacular glory. Who is Jesus? Firstborn of Firstborn of creation, firstborn of the dead, so that in all things he might be first. May that be true in all of our life. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, precious Jesus, you are the creator of the universe. You made us and therefore we belong to you. You are the sustainer of all things. You give us life and breath and everything else. You paid for our sins and the sins of this world and you paid for my sins You disarmed Satan at the cross and brought about peace. You rose from the dead, Lord Jesus, guaranteeing that we too will rise from the dead, that we are now part of your forever family. We want you, Jesus, to be first in every part of our life. Empower us, we plead, by your Spirit, fueled by your grace, to have Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. And we pray this in his powerful name. Amen. Friends, I want to say just before I go that if you prayed that prayer for the first time, then you've ta- you've bec- you've made p- you are now at right you are now right with the Lord Jesus Christ that you are facing a future of assurance free from accusation you've started a new relationship we want to get help to you so get in contact with us and let us know you've made that decision but we'd love you to love you to join our explaining Christianity course starting in a couple of weeks time it's going to be really important to ground yourself and, and, and like many perhaps you're out there you've got questions and you want to know more then explaining Christianity is exactly the course that you need to be a part of friends let's remember this day of the sacrifices that were made by many men and women over the centuries But let's remember most of all the greatest sacrifice of all when Jesus gave his his best when we were at our worst.
says lost With the greatest of my crowns Mean nothing to me now For I counted up the cost And all my wealth is in the cross All my wealth is in the cross How amazing is that our invisible God chose to reveal himself to us through Jesus and that in all things we find purpose through Jesus, that in him and for him everything was created. Praise God. Now we'd just like to remind you again of explaining Christianity and belonging. So if you want to jump to our website, please don't forget to sign up for those. We'd love to have you come along. And whilst you're on your website, there's also an opportunity to give. And we just want to thank God so much for your generosity. Um, All that you give um, allows the gospel to continue to go out and advance, not only from MBM, but into the entire nations of this world. So we thank God for you. Yeah, I'm really glad that you've joined us today and tuned into MBM online. Um, This is coming to the end of uh, of our service, but... Uh, We'd love you to hang around. There's going to be some questions from the passage that we looked at come up on the screen uh, and some prayer points. We'd love you to chat through and pray through those. Uh, If you don't have anybody in your lounge room with you now, why don't you call a friend and discuss it with them? Uh, Thanks so much for joining us today and see you next week.